My name is Marius Roma and uh, I have been a professor in the psychiatry in the University of Maastricht, but now I'm pensioned, I'm over 80, so uh, it's not a time to work very hard anymore. That has been in the time, but we started in about 1985 with a person who heard voices naturally, because it's about voices and she heard voices. But one of the first who also asked how could you learn to cope with your voices. And then I realized that we did not know much about that ex that experience, that we always uh, took it as a symptom of an illness and not as an experience in itself. So to ask, to aunt, she had a lot of more problems, but that was most hindering and reducing also her activities. She was uh, very well musical, what was, she was singing in a choir, and most all people hearing voices are musical. In that sense, they have one thing. They all have an, uh, a certain uh, yeah, connection with that is musicality. So in that sense, it might be that they have a better developed right half of this, uh, this, the, the brain. Because that kind of... Uh, musicality is situated but that doesn't mean that it's a, a defect it means with all the things we know the brain is naturally also involved so in that sense the sensitivity most of people have is also an, an um, characteristic of the right uh, brain part so in that sense, I think people hearing voices are like other people, but are different in the sense that they might have been the better developed right uh, part of the cerebrum in certain areas. Uh, then when she asked what to do with her voices, I didn't have any answer for that. I only thought I better contact her with other people hearing voices because I don't know much and when they have to, want to, to learn how to cope with it they might better share their experiences and so I started to uh, bring people together because in the uh, for in, in, in the, the organization I worked we had quite a lot of people hearing voices and so I uh, found a girl of her age, and that was the first. And then I sat down, and they were talking about their experience. And then it was clear that they had many differentiations. They could talk about their experience very openly, uh, fluently, and they had many aspects which they exchanged. And that made it a believable, real uh, perception, because otherwise you would not be so in detail. They had different experience in the sense that the voices were at different situations important for them or hindering for them. But the fact of the voices were they heard were the same. They talked then they recognized each other experience. That was opening the idea here is something realistic, they know details, etc. And then <clears throat> we repeated to have these uh, conversations between different voices, <clears throat> and every time they knew, they recognized each other's experience. But then after a while they said, yeah, this is very nice. It's better to talk about it because it's nicer when then that the other person, which was generally in psychiatry, don't listen at all. So it's nicer to talk about it than to be uh, not listened to. And being listened to is a nicer feeling than just being as if you never had these forces, so denied. Then we... Um, 
Yeah, there we thought about it, and Sandra, with whom I worked together from the beginning, thought about uh, how could we get into contact with other people hearing voices who can cope with them, because uh, if they have such a lot of uh, ex uh, the same experience and understand each other well, they as well, it could well be possible that there must be somebody who uh, know, have learned how to cope with this experience. So that made us to prepare and ask a, uh, an, uh, program of a, sh a talk show in, on the television program and we had a person we know who could relate us to them so we could ask the question and then they told us yeah but then it should be having a news uh, item in it so we said what shall we do now let's let's organize a conference of voices because that has never happened so why not be organizing a first conference of voice years? And that took the, the interest of the television to then Sonja of Maandag, it was called at that time. And then Patsy, she was called, uh, who uh, asked uh, uh, me how to learn to cope with uh, <coughs> her voices. And she was uh, able and uh, prepared to tell her story. She didn't like, but took that as a consequence. If you want to learn something, then you have to be more open and tell about your experience, because you can't go on the television and only say, I hear voices. Then you have to tell more about your experience. And that was a special experience, because after that, uh, performance after that show very many people telephoned and uh, and so there were 700 reactions which was yeah astonishing and there was many people who um, reacted and also told they heard their voices 500 of the 700 told they heard voices themselves <coughs> and we then had also organized that when, she, when the person would telephone, there were people who wrote down their name and their address because we wanted to write to them because of this conference, this, uh, to organize that. <coughs> so that was the start of the project. But why it became a project is because when the people reacted, there were a lot of people hearing voices who never became patients. So that was for me anyhow quite new, that there were people hearing voices and never had become patients because they could cope very well. And they were also inspired, some of them were inspired by their voices. And so we learned by doing, in, going into that way, that you have writers who develop their characters from the voices they hear and you have uh, people who are complementary therapists who have the experience that they have a better feeling of uh, uh, understanding the problems people bring to them and besides that they go into serious what people experience so they listen to voices and so in that sense it became interesting because we put it outside psychiatry we said this is that's why so many people reacted <coughs> we did not do as if it was a psychiatric problem it was just a problem of a person and we weren't like to get into contact with people who had that same problem but could cope better with it so we got very many reactions because I think it was outside psychiatry. Because in Germany, in Berlin, they did the same and they had only 20 reactions because they put it as well still a problem of psychiatry. And we put it outside psychiatry and that's also what the first book, Accepting Voices, a way of uh, a project outside 
mental health because psychiatry is not trusted by voice here and not very much they are not much interested because they are not having any troubles with their voices and they don't healthy voice hearers don't understand why patient voice hearers do so difficult with them why they are afraid of their voices for them that is a strange way of handling their voices they could learn from them and they had a positive relationship with them so that was the reason we went into a research project trying to get more knowledge about voice hearing in a broader scope not only with patients but also with non-patients and so all our, the the books we wrote also compare people who hear voices and become a patient with people who hear voices and could cope well with them so that learned us different things that learned us first of all that in itself it's not a pathological phenomenon it's not a psychotic symptom because a lot of people having these experiences and that then by going into the background of in the research we discovered that there are all kind of emotional conflicts they met in their life that might be traumatic conflicts but also accepting homosexuality or a relationship between the parents they could cope with couldn't cope with or something they experience as uh, in not, uh, for children can have things that they don't know how to uh, resolve because that's one of the projects we've studied 80 children over a longer period and Sandra did that and wrote her PhD about this research so we went into research of a number of different populations of people hearing voices and the most systematic of them was Sandra's research and the research of comparing people with the diagnosis of schizophrenia with people diagnosis of dissociative disorder with people having never had the diagnosis because they could cope well and from that study we learned about the background and we learned about that it started mostly with a situation where they emotionally couldn't cope well couldn't cope with very well in the patient group not in the non-patient group that we learned also that the explanation of the voices <coughs> is something understandable when you listen to how they experience the voice <coughs> because if the trouble comes because they were um, uh, no, yeah, they were sexually abused mostly those people hear the voice of the abuser and so then it's reasonable that they hear the voice and call the voice the abuser but in psychiatry they call it a delusion because the abuser is there but it's it's very understandable that if you hear the voice of somebody you recognize you say this voice is his voice and so you have also a voice which they explain as God when these voices were very dominant and always said they were right and when you go into the life history you found sometimes out that that were voices from people in their youth have been educated quite strictly in the sense with not bad idea, uh, not bad uh, purposes but just yeah strictly kind of <coughs> education as uh, bringing up so they might hear a voice as if it are God. In brain research it's also clear that you have developmental parts in your brain where you uh, keep memories of very early dates. And so those people have difficulty when they are older to remember what has exactly happened, but they are not they still hear the voice which made the trouble. So in that sense, uh, 
it's not that strange. And so we developed an interview in which we asked a number of questions to learn to know these voices better. So we see them mostly as persons because they talk about them as people, because they talk about them as somebody they recognized. Or, uh, <clears throat> and so then you could try to get to know that person better by asking questions about their age, their sex, their way of helping them or not helping them, their being more the boss, how to or more able to cope with that. Or you can ask a lot of questions about a voice, but you have to differentiate the different voices because different voices have different characters, have different sex, have different uh, men or women, uh, different ways of uh, tr uh, treating the person. Uh, so you can make a person be out of the voices and learn to know that voice better in relation to the voices by asking questions, not by wanting to know everything, but just trying to know the person better. So the way, the attitude is knowing the person and his voices better, which first is difficult because they want to get rid of the voices, only in the beginning they just are making them afraid or asking them to do things they don't want to do. So in that sense it's reasonable that they want to get rid of them, but it's not possible to get rid of something that is living within you. So first you have to know what it represents in fact. So we try to uh, uh, answer two questions with this interview. Who do the voices represent? and what problem do the voices represent? And that are main questions to analyze what is the problem behind the voices, which give an explanation of why they have this, this uh, characteristics of these voices. And also from what they tell the person is mostly told by the the person who was traumatically uh, handling, like uh, bullying, they have, they experience a group of people, so they carry the bullies with them over a longer time, as if it's a group in their heads. And with, uh, <coughs> so you have, that's different, you have to ask, how many voices do you hear? And then try to find out the characteristics with this interview, if you like, uh, of each voice separate. You can't uh, talk about hearing voices as a general because every person hears different voices or there are also a lot who only hear one voice, then it's more easy to analyze the characteristics of that voice, but otherwise you need to go alongside the different voices. So the phenomenon is not something you can just put together in one, one symptom. It's not a symptom, it's an experience. And by the way, we know that healthy voices who can cope with them have the same experience is also a strange voice. It's not their own thoughts or their own emotions. They don't experience them <coughs> as their own. They experience them as strange. And that's why that's the characteristic of a hallucination. But then not a, a hallucination as a psychopathological phenomenon, but as a recognizable phenomenon, phenomenon related to things that had happened in their life history. But it takes time to, for, to get over the anxiety. So the first time you have to learn to talk about them. And then you have this different, this, this positive, say, uh, hope giving, say, there are a lot of people who have 
learn to cope with their voices, who have got more knowledge about the background, and then most of them are becoming less afraid, and most voiceers also have voices that help them. Because, for instance, a voice might say, uh, you can as well uh, make an end to it, because if you don't change, there will be not any change, so there is no solution. And this metaphor is then seen as a suicidal uh, expression, but it's seen as if you don't do anything, there will be no change. So you have to translate the, the literary text into a metaphoric message. And that is something which you have to get used to. Uh, because this, it, it, they reflect in the beginning also when they start something that happened, then they also reflect the kind of emotion, so they function as a defense mechanism. And, uh, and then they, um, they have influences that promote, provoke the voices, so they are sensible to certain uh, situations in which the voices are more apparent than in other times. That's about what I would say uh, as a basis. It's already some time. But, uh, yeah, I think that's 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 all because yeah. I had some uh, sub questions, but you already yeah. already answered it. I try to uh, no, ma maybe just just one, but short shortly. What is the what is the major difference uh, in a life story of the voice hearers who had some uh, who are inside psychiatric uh, system and outside? What is the difference? in the, their biographies, are they also, most of the time, some kind of event, traumatic event, or not? Is it only difference b between reaction, or how to cope, or that there is no trauma, or what is the <coughs> major no, the difference? Trauma may be, might be there in both groups, might be less clear in the, the healthy ones, but the attitude towards the trauma is also different. People who keep healthy are not afraid of their voices, while patients are always afraid. So they think it's a sign of a pathology. And that's mostly told them by other people. Because when they tell about their voices, other people look strange at them. So they also have to learn not to tell too much about them in the beginning, because you get always negative. Then people try to to help them to get rid of the voices and then they uh, send them to their doctor and the doctor send them to a psychiatrist and then you are just on the wrong way because the psychiatrist will make it a psychopathological phenomenon while it isn't it's a very human variation of uh, as a reaction of experience and the experience then is in patients more a traumatic experience than in non-patients, but not 100%. There are also quite some non-patients have had traumatic experience, but they do not lose their own personal stability. They keep distance as a person and they keep positive to themselves. And so they listen more to the positive side of the voices than to the negative side. But people who have experienced long time uh, intensive trauma tend to be become unsecure about themselves also. So the insecurity about the person itself makes a difference between the uh, patients and the non-patients. Thank yeah. you. And what, in one sentence, what would you uh, say to the voice hearers who are now uh, uh, seeing you for the first time and hearing about hearing voices approach for the first time? Uh, you have to learn to know your voices better, but that is not anything you like to do. So first try to cope with your anxiety and do it easy on, step by step. Don't force yourself. The hope is that a lot of people have learned to cope with them and are happy they have them. 
but that is a process of learning. You can't step from one time to another. And it can be also if you really understand why you hear the voices. Voices is not just something general. You hear voices and your neighbor hears different voices. There are never two people who hear the same voice. So it's a personal thing and you have to detect what is personal in your life giving rise to your voice. But that's sometimes also shameful, bringing guilt. I mean, there might be having been difficult things you rather would have never had happened. But yeah, denial doesn't solve a problem. And psychiatry denies, in fact, the background goes into a symptom and an illness, give it only a name, it doesn't solve anything. And medication reduce the emotion, which is in the beginning when you're very afraid, reasonable, but it doesn't solve your original problem because they don't take the time to analyze what's behind it.